It was one of the most feared high-performance weapons of the 20th century. When it appeared in the skies over Korea, it sent the unsuspecting West spiraling into a state of shock. It was the Russian-made MiG-15. We were at full throttle, doing as fast as we could go, and we were barely keeping up with them. Until the arrival of the American F-86 Sabre, the Russian jet outclassed everything in the sky, astonishing American pilots with its lightning maneuverability and intense firepower. We could hit the MiG a number of times, and the MiG wouldn't necessarily go down. But if the MiG hit an F-86 with those cannons, the F-86 was not going to make it home. But under the umbrella of the Cold War, this deadly game of aerial combat held a dark secret that threatened to throw the world into nuclear war. Using unique Soviet archive film and color reenactment, Battle Stations enters the secret world of the MiG-15. Russia in the 1920s was a country of turmoil, revolution, and change. Stalin's reign of terror permeated every aspect of life in the Soviet Union. Soviet aircraft designers lived in a world of secrecy and fear. Although well behind the West, Soviet designers were actively experimenting with advanced technology. But by the 1930s, much of this innovative work was suppressed by the politics of the day. Aircraft designers knew that to fail could mean banishment to a labor camp in Siberia or a bullet in the back of the head. You were living under an administration which was happy to shoot large numbers of engineers or anybody else uh, on simple whims, political whims or whatever. Uh, and so there was an atmosphere that really is very difficult for people in the West to understand. Stalin astonished the world in August 1939 by signing a non-aggression pact with Germany. When his top engineer discovered that the German ME-109 fighter was far superior to anything in the Soviet Union, Stalin flew into a rage. Nikolai Polikarpov, his chief designer, immediately fell out of favor as too old and stayed. Stalin began to search for a younger and more dynamic team. He selected a young designer called Artum Mikoyan to head a new design bureau and named Mikhail Gurevich as his deputy. Artum Ivanovich was, of course, a designer, but an exceptional organizer, too. He was the ideas man, whereas Gurevich was someone who was very good at detail and, and fine-tuning the designs. Artum Mikoyan was from Armenia, the son of a carpenter. He had trained as a pilot in the Soviet Air Force and later became an engineer. His brother was on Stalin's Council of Ministers. By 1937, he had joined the main Soviet design bureau led by Polikarpov. Here he worked on several successful aircraft designs. Now he would replace his boss and lead the Soviet Union into the jet age. Mikhail Gorevich was a Ukrainian. He trained as an engineer and after the revolution became an aircraft designer in Moscow. Here he met Mikoyan and they became good friends. Gurevich liked Artum Mikoyan a lot. He was perfectly happy to be his deputy. They were both kind and decent people, and that's also why they worked so well together. The motto of the new experimental bureau was speed and altitude. All their future aircraft designs would be known as MiGs, after the combination of its creators' names. It was the start of a partnership that would be associated around the world with successful aircraft for decades. Then in June 1941, Hitler launched his surprise offensive against the Soviet Union. 
Stalin's Soviet Air Force was totally unprepared and ill-equipped to fight the modern German fighters. Russian losses during the Great Patriotic War were massive. Final victory over the Nazi war machine was largely due to the remarkable success of the Red Army, but the Soviet Air Force urgently needed to modernize. By the end of the war, tensions that would soon turn into the Cold War began to grow. The Allies now had the jet engine, space rockets, and the atom bomb. Soviet designers needed to catch up, and catch up fast. Stalin was furious that the Soviet Union's technology had fallen behind that of the West, and he told his designers to bridge the gap. Not an easy task, and Stalin wasn't the sort of man that you argued with, but in one respect, Soviet technicians did have an advantage. They'd captured a lot of German technology, amongst it the German Me-262 jet fighter. And they were able to build on this, to build their own jet at what was the beginning of the atomic age. The Mikoyan and Gurevich team took advantage of this captured technology and began to develop a new jet fighter, the MiG-9. At first it was planned with MiG-9 to put the engines in the same place as the ME-262. But later on a different decision was made and the engines were placed in the fuselage, which was recognized to be more effective. Tests proved that this was the correct decision. In April 1946, fitted with two German BMW jet engines, the MiG-9 was the Soviet Union's first prototype jet ever to fly. At the high speeds, bailing out would now become sheer suicide. So the first ejection seat in the USSR was successfully tested. In the jet age, many more design problems had to be solved. They realized in order to reach high speed, close to the speed of sound, they needed a new arrow-shaped wing. That wing would push back the shock wave and air resistance in order to achieve much higher speeds. The design and transition from a straight wing to a swept back wing was to give the MiG its most famous characteristic. Now with the cigar-shaped fuselage and swept wings, all the jet fighter needed was a much more powerful engine. The problem with the uh, ME-262 engine, uh, which the Germans uh, had run into and was the major factor uh, uh, in, in its late appearance in the war, was how do you make a turbine blade stay on the turbine given the kinds of pressures you're putting on a jet engine? And uh, that was a problem which the Soviets were not capable of solving. At this crucial moment, the new post-war British Labour government, as part of a trade agreement, invited Mikoyan and a Soviet delegation to visit the British Rolls-Royce engine factory. The Russians were eager to get access to the latest Rolls-Royce jet technology. Stalin reacted with typical suspicion, asking, what fool will sell us his secrets? On arrival in July 1946, Mikoyan and the Soviet delegation were welcomed with typical British hospitality. He was invited to the house of one of the Rolls-Royce bosses, and they played English billiards. Artum played billiards well. I know, because I played billiards with him many times. He'd lost one game and then offered a challenge and said, let's play another game, and if I win, you sell us your jet engines. Bizarrely, the future course of the MiG was settled across the green felt of an English billiard table. Mikoyan had beaten the British at their own game. He had won the famous Rolls-Royce jet engine. It sounds like an anecdote, but he told me that this was true. 
Although the Russians were about to receive the best of British jet technology, certain question marks remained. The visit to the Rolls-Royce factory put those questions to rest. The Russians had another trick to play. The most important question was what were the blades made of? During the tour of the factory, one of the members of the delegation wore special boots with spongy soles, and he secretly trod all around the metal lathe, so lots of shavings stuck to his boots. He took these shavings back to analyze in the USSR, so by the time the engine was purchased, they already knew the composition of the alloy, and this helped to speed up the copying of the Neen engine and launch the Russian engines into mass production. The supposedly harmless gift of the jet engine turned out to be a deadly mistake by the British. The Rolls-Royce jet engine was quickly copied, and Stalin at last had his new generation of jet fighter aircraft. In just four years, MiG-15s powered by copies of Rolls-Royce jet engines would be shooting down American and British planes over Korea. The Tuchina Air Show. Moscow, July 1949. A new generation of Soviet MiG-15 jet fighters are paraded in front of Stalin and the public for the first time. The MiG designers Mikoyan and Gurevich had been awarded the Stalin Prize for their winning design. The MiG-15 had a maximum speed of 652 miles per hour and was capable of flying at 50,000 feet. It was given powerful armaments with two 23mm and a single 37mm cannon. Most of the pilots who flew the MiG-15 were enormously impressed. My first impressions are hard to describe in words. In the MiG-15, the conditions for the pilot were wonderful. It was designed with love. The view was fantastic because the cockpit was right at the front of the plane. While I was flying, it was like gliding over a precipice. The MiG-15 at first sight seemed to me to be like a new day in aviation. I can't describe it in words. It was indescribable. First of all, silence, as if the plane was standing still on Earth. No vibrations, no noise. The speed's going up 600, 700, 800. You feel overwhelmed. You just want to break into song. But the Russians were still behind the Americans in the race for the next generation of modern jet fighters. In the spring of 1949, a US Air Force F-86 Sabre jet had flown supersonic for the first time. The F-86, frankly, stood out in this field because of its graceful beauty and the fact that it was an airplane now with a jet engine, which we thought would be very simple, uh, like turning a valve on to go and turning it off when you want to stop. It wasn't quite that simple, but nevertheless, it was the fantastic advancement in uh, aeroscience. Within a year of these developments, the American jet planes would be flying into combat with Russian MiG-15s over the skies of Asia. For the pilots of both countries, flying in the jet age would require new skills. Russian test pilots were worried about the tendency of the MiG to go into uncontrollable spins. One of its test pilots was killed after putting the MiG into a spin. I have tested 22 types of planes for spinning characteristics. A spin has always been a difficult element of flying. In all planes, there were incidents when a pilot could not get out of a spin. When you are spinning, 
you have to switch off all your normal reflexes. Spinning out of control is every pilot's nightmare. To survive in the jet age, the MiG pilots needed to keep a cool head and handle the aircraft with great sensitivity. You have to overcome your instinctive responses. This is what made the MiG so different from all previous planes. On May Day 1950, the MiG-15 flew past an unsuspecting audience in Moscow's Red Square. The intelligence failure of the Western observers to recognize Stalin's new powerful weapon in the skies above would have disastrous consequences. MiGs were already in the throes of full-scale production. Only a month later, the Soviet-supported North Korean People's Army launched a massive invasion of South Korea. Stalin thought that the communists could invade South Korea without generating any military response from the West. Yes, there'd be the usual diplomatic protests, but it wouldn't go any further than that. In fact, he'd misjudged the situation badly. President Truman responded quickly. The United Nations agreed to send troops. And within four months, the invading North Koreans had been rolled right the way back. Now, American B-29 bombers roamed across North Korea's skies with no resistance, and fighter bombers continuously attacked troop movements at will. By November 1950, the American-led UN forces had advanced right across North Korea and were approaching the Chinese border along the Yalu River. Mao Zedong, the Chinese communist leader, wanted a cause to unite his young nation. The American advance to China's border provided the perfect opportunity. On Thanksgiving Day 1950, advance units of the UN force in North Korea paused along the Yalu River, the border with China. On the following day, the war changed dramatically when tens of thousands of soldiers of the Chinese People's Army stormed out of the mountains and attacked the UN forces. As the bitter winter weather closed in, UN troops were forced into a humiliating retreat. Stalin felt he had to support his communist ally, but only in total secrecy. In December 1950, Soviet MiGs were deployed in China to be flown secretly by disguised and highly experienced Russian pilots. Our departure to China was to remain a secret, so all our insignia had to be removed. We looked as though we had been demobilized. On arrival, we were all given Chinese uniforms, but most officers did not like it. So as soon as they got their pay, the officers changed into civilian clothes and wore those instead. When we arrived at the area of military action at Antung Airfield, it was the time when the Americans had superiority of the air. But as our squadrons appeared there, we took the air supremacy away from them by attacking their piston fighter planes and bombers. The sudden appearance of this new Soviet jet fighter threw the West into a state of shock. No longer was American air power to dominate the skies. The United States Air Force now had a fight on its hands. December 1950, 
Soviet-built MiG-15s fly into action for the very first time. The MiG-15 had an enormous impact when it appeared in the skies above Korea. First, it was a psychological blow to the Americans, who were shocked, frankly, at being technically outclassed by this new war machine. Uh, and secondly, it had a very severe physical impact. It was a cut above the propeller-driven aircraft which the Americans were using at the time, and it shot down an awful lot of fighters, and particularly bombers. The Russian fighters operated secretly from safe bases around Antung, north of the Yalu River in China. The area between the Yalu River on the Chinese border and central North Korea became known as MiG Alley. Western aircraft entered at their peril. In addition to supplying the Chinese with MiGs, the Russians were also secretly training Chinese and North Korean pilots. I was one of the 80 chosen to go to the Manchu and uh, uh, trained by the first by the North Koreans to fly the propeller planes. And after that, we turned over to the Soviet Air Force to learn to fly the jet planes. All we learned was just take off and landing. That's about it. And then uh, they uh, told us that uh, we are now ready for the solo in the MiG-15. So everybody had uh, some problems because of the tremendous thrust uh, and also uh, high altitude capabilities. If you take Koreans, no feudal era reactive. The Koreans, they had to leap from the feudal age into the jet age. Can you imagine what a gap? They didn't know anything, and they were put into these jet planes. This wasn't easy to do. There was a lot of talking and persuading, and we had to convince them of how things had to be done. I needed a whole day to get to know their names and to get to know them. I didn't speak any Chinese, and those I had to teach didn't know any Russian. The pilots taught them to fly, and we taught them how to service and maintain the plane. But the MiG's air supremacy was about to be challenged. Within weeks, a squadron of the new American F-86 Sabres was rushed from the United States to take the MiGs head on. You were afraid of them a little bit. And of course, with our F-86s, we knew it was a fine airplane and we knew it had all kinds of combat capability. But until you actually engaged the enemy aircraft and actually found out uh, you against the other fella how it performed, then it didn't give you a lot of confidence. When the MiGs first engaged in head-to-head -head combat against the American Sabres, they finally met their match. A new era in aerial combat was about to begin, the jet versus jet dogfight. We were patrolling on this patrol line when we spotted these four airplanes coming toward us at a very impressive high rate of speed. My first impression then of the MiG was that I was up against something that was really a dynamo. So I started maneuvering into position to keep hitting them to see if I couldn't get the airplane to blow. And I used almost my entire load of ammunition on him before he finally looked like he was out of control and went on into the ground. The MiG pilots realized they no longer had supremacy of the skies. Early dogfights meant that new tactics had to be learned fast. This aerial combat was basically chaotic, both vertically and horizontally. But from the battle, we learned we should never fight sabers horizontally. The MiG had a better than a 2,500 foot per minute rate of climb advantage. Could turn tighter could out-accelerate, could out-decelerate, and were roughly the same speed. 
we, we talk about uh, the 86 being faster and the MiG being faster, it depends on what altitude you're at. Now, we're not talking about a large or an excessive difference. We're, we're talking maybe three, four, five miles an hour. The Sabre was a good plane, but its engine seemed to be weaker because my MiG could climb up and escape from him, but he could not escape from me. I would always catch up with him. Our MiG was very well armed, much better than the Sabre. We had three machine guns, and the caliber of the guns was such that one hit could destroy a Sabre. We just had 50 caliber. Uh, we could hit the MiG uh, a number of times, and the MiG wouldn't necessarily go down. But if the MiG hit an F-86 uh, a few times with those cannons, the F-86 was not going to make it home. We fought against them like sportsmen. Whoever handled their plane best won. If you are weak, bad luck. You look for a moment of hesitation. In an air battle, which lasts for, say, 20 minutes, you may only get two or three seconds, and once you notice him hesitating, that's when you press the trigger and hit the target. The main role of the MiG-15 was to intercept American bombers, which were raiding North Korea with their Sabre escorts. The principal MiG tactic was to take advantage of its superior altitude and lie in wait at heights of up to 50,000 feet and then ambush the American air armadas below. If possible, go up to 50,000 feet. 50,000 feet, then American planes wouldn't come up there. You go up to 50,000 feet and look down at the American plane, go down and uh, shoot. In October 1951, Lev Ivanov led a Soviet MiG attack on 48 B-29 bombers. They came flying in from the sea without cover at an angle of 30 degrees towards the bridge, which was the best approach to bomb it. The Sabres came in to protect the bombers, but they were four minutes late, so naturally we took advantage of that. As soon as I saw a Sabre, I got onto its tail, aimed, fired, and that was that. So many bombers were lost that this day became known as Black Tuesday. The MiGs had outmaneuvered, outflown, and outgunned their opponents. With precious few Sabres available to stand up to the MiGs, it looked as though the challenge of the Sabre was overrated. But for the Russians, the price of keeping their activities secret would play a major role in the battle for the skies over Korea. The Russian MiGs that roamed the skies above Korea had astonished the West. Now total victory for either side looked unlikely, and the Korean War would be a limited war. For the West to contain communism, and for the communists to avoid the humiliation of defeat. The Soviet MiG-15s enjoyed many advantages. They were flown out of bases across the border in China, which were out of bounds to the American air crews. So after combat in MiG Alley, the MiGs had a safe haven to return to. Although the MiG-15s were flying in Chinese colors, it was an open secret that many of the pilots were actually highly experienced Russian aces from World War II. But Russian pilots were walking a deadly fine line. Neither side could admit that US and Soviet jet pilots were facing each other in open combat for fear of escalating the conflict into nuclear war. 
the Russians, uh, the Soviets were very hesitant for obvious reasons to say they were flying uh, the MiG-15 aircraft. Uh, and so um, they simply never claimed uh, or admitted that they were flying the airplanes, but we knew. I mean, we could listen to the broadcasts of uh, uh, fighter controllers and the fighter pilots, and it was clearly Russians flying the airplanes. Вести переговоры на китайском языке в воздушном бою. We were told to only communicate in Chinese during a combat. But it didn't work because we always broke into Russian. And sometimes we even broke the bounds of decent language. And we would swear at each other in the air. The Soviet pilots experienced other frustrations. They were not allowed to fly over enemy territory in case they were shot down and a Russian pilot was captured and paraded before the world. Nor could they fly over the sea for fear of being shot down and both aircraft and pilot being captured by Americans. Ну, лично сам я и летчикам своим вношал. I decided that I must not be taken prisoner and that I would rather crash the plane and kill myself. I would not become a prisoner of war. One pilot who had to be ejected crossed the front line by mistake. He was encircled by enemy troops. So rather than being taken prisoner and being tortured and humiliated, he took his own life by shooting himself. I think I would have acted in the same way. The war for supremacy in the air began to produce aces on both sides. Colonel Yevgeny Pepelayev had the highest number of kills per mission, shooting down an enemy aircraft once in every five missions. Out of 20 planes, I shot down 16 Sabres, two F-94s, one F-98, and one F-84. To shoot down an enemy plane, we tried to approach him from behind and as close as we could to his tail. The closer you are, the more likely the hit. I had uh, the gun sight almost on him, but it wasn't there, and I didn't fire. You don't shoot until the picture's right. He did not get away. I knocked his engine out. He was almost being consumed by uh, engine fire. During these dramatic dogfights in the air, MiG pilots discovered the remarkable abilities of their aircraft to take enormous punishment. I was flying towards the ground, following my leader, as it was my responsibility to guard his tail. The American plane was waiting there for me to come out of the dive. It was then that he shot me. Then during the dive, I realized I must save myself, so I made a decision to eject. I moved my hand to the ejection handle and thought I'd pressed it, because in that moment I felt such g-force, such an enormous amount, I felt my bones were cracking. Then everything went dark and I fainted. When I came to, I opened my eyes and saw I was still in the plane. This came as a shock. If I had ejected myself, why was I still inside the plane? I grabbed the stick to gain control, and at that moment I heard a horrendous mechanical screeching. My brain was in overdrive. What shall I do next? 
As all the hydraulic systems had been blown apart, Bondarenko did not know whether his landing gear was operational. I thought that I'd have to do a belly landing with just the left wheel out. And as I approached the ground, I hit it with the wheel. And luckily for me, then the whole undercarriage came down. I was so happy that this plane had saved my life. It's not just words, it's true. It used all its remaining strength to return me home and land. I came up to the plane and I kissed it on the nose and I thought, how wonderful we have such miraculous technology. The MiG-15 had earned its affectionate nickname, Samolyat Soldat, the soldier aircraft. By spring 1953, the Korean air war was in stalemate. The US military, keen to capture the Russian technology, offered a huge reward and political asylum to any pilot that delivered a MiG to South Korea. No one had yet responded. But a daring escape attempt by a lone pilot would provide a last minute twist to a war that seemed to have no end. By 1953, both sides recognized that the Korean War was unwinnable. After two years of negotiations, in July, a truce was finally signed at Panmunjom. But the Korean peninsula would remain divided and an armed camp. The fighting in Korea came to an end in July 1953, but of course the Cold War still went on. And during it, both sides were trying to get hold of one another's secrets, particularly in terms of military technology. The Americans were especially anxious to get their hands on a MiG-15. The Americans made an offer of $100,000, equivalent to several million dollars today, and political asylum for the first pilot who would defect and deliver a MiG intact. A 21-year-old North Korean pilot, Lieutenant No Kum Sok, an ardent anti-communist, was already planning one of the most spectacular escapes from the communist bloc. So my aim was that how to defect successfully and land on an American airbase so that I can ask for political asylum. So on the September 21st, Sunday morning, even before the breakfast, I got in the plane and took off to the north. And then the plane went to north and I came down south and toward the Pyongyang, toward the east. Then that's where I finally made the defect. It was not easy. In fact, that defection was harder than the equivalent to, say, a 50 combat mission. Now south of the demilitarized zone, he flashed into UN territory. Just four tense minutes after crossing the border, he spotted the US Kimpo Air Base and decided to risk a landing. Radar people missed me, and also anti-aircraft gunners I was afraid of, they missed me. He decided to land, when, to his amazement, he saw a Sabre coming straight towards him at the opposite end of the runway. Well, he hadn't seen me, so we landed together, both ends. And then we passed in the runway, and of course I knew he was there, he was coming down, but he hadn't seen me until we passed. Then after passed, of course he was frightened. But at the end of the runway, he stopped the engine and he jumped out. And he was wondering what kind of uh, nuts landed from wrong side. Commanders at the base panicked, thinking the war had started again, and scrambled every plane they had. Lieutenant No Kum Sok did not know of the reward. He just wanted to fly to freedom. The surrendered MiG-15 was taken to Okinawa, where it was dismantled and rigorously examined. Later, it was airlifted to the United States and underwent further exhaustive flight testing. The plane was pushed to its limits by America's top test pilots, Tom Collins and the world-renowned Chuck Yeager. 
I told Chuck Yeager that don't deliberately go into spinning stall because this plane is uh, very uh, quirky. Sometimes you get out, sometimes you cannot come out. If you cannot come out, you have to bail out and you lose a plane. So he didn't put the plane to deliberate the uh, uh, stall. Americans wondered uh, whether well, MiG-15 could be a supersonic. Then Chuck Yeager has proved that it's not a supersonic because he actually went up to 50,000 feet. He dived down, straight down, and he almost lost his life because uh, he was totally out of control. The control system didn't respond until he got down as low as uh, near 3,000 feet. And the chaser plane flown by uh, Tom Collins gestured, hand gestured him to bail out. But he didn't bail out, and he somehow he pulled out at 3,000 feet above the water. The test flights proved that indeed the MiG was an exceptional plane, but revealed no new supersonic technology. The defector, Lieutenant No Kum Sok, went to work for the US government and became an American citizen. With a Korean truce signed, the Soviet MiG pilots returned home, but the MiG-15 had already earned its place in history. Eventually, the Russians claimed the MiG combat record gave them a four to one advantage. The U.S. claimed a 10 to 1 ratio in favor of the F-86 Sabre against the MiG-15. The actual numbers are in dispute, but whatever the final score, the MiG-15 was an extraordinary aeronautical achievement and way ahead of its time. I think in terms of the challenges that the Soviet Design Bureau has confronted in, in putting together the uh, MiG-15, given the limitations of technology uh, that they confronted in industrial production, uh, that they did an incredible job in putting uh, together an aircraft that could really uh, uh, challenge uh, the F-86. The plane was very easy to handle and very reliable. At high altitude, it was superior to the Sabre because of its ability to operate at a much higher ceiling. The MiG was way ahead of its time, and all other planes in the world, apart from the Sabre, of course. You could perform all kinds of high-speed maneuvers. It was a great fighter. I liked it and was very impressed by it. Back in the Soviet Union, it would be 40 years before the Russian pilots could admit to having fought in the Korean War. Eventually, over 13,000 MiGs would be produced and flown by most nations throughout the communist bloc. Fortunately for the West, no other MiG fighter would ever cause such a surprise as had the MiG-15 in the secret air wars over Korea. Yet for its pilots, the MiG remains the supreme jet fighter. The MiG-15 was the best plane in the world, the best fighter in the world. I am convinced of that because it saved my life. It was very tough and could take a lot of punishment. It was a lovely plane and I can bow to it with gratitude. You see, first place, uh, my defection was I was in the North Korean military academy, naval academy, 
not because I was a communist, because that's the only way to continue my education. So I wanted to have a higher education rather than going, stopping the education, go to the industry. So when I was in the Naval Academy, I was really unhappy. I was thinking of somehow to get out of there and go to the non-communist country. But when I went to the Air Force, I was really glad because uh, they gave me an opportunity someday to defect. So that was always in my mind. But I had to be very cautious. I have to have a right opportunity. Otherwise, try just defect to kill. I I might have shot down and uh, get into more trouble. If I was shot down in, uh, say, uh, South Korea, I could probably become a POW. So my aim was that how to defect successfully and land on an American air base so that I can ask for the political asylum. That was a difficult part. So I was awaiting that moment. During the war, that was impossible because I just figured out that I cannot do it. But my first attempt, they tried to send us for strafing mission against the U.S. air base. I was thinking of landing at that time, which was a very risky thing, too. But I thought that since I'm already there, then all I have to do is somehow to land and uh, ask for the political asylum. But they canceled because they were too risky. In fact, the North Korean commander who uh, initiated that plan, he was kicked out of the Air Force because he was arguing against the U.S., I mean, Soviet general that uh, he want to execute that plan. Soviet general said, don't do that because uh, too risky. Yeah, second unsuccessful unsuc attempt was uh, on August 15th, after the ceasefire was signed uh, on the 1953, the Pyongyang, North Korean capital, there was a parade, and we flew over the parade ground uh, from the air. Now, I was thinking of uh, flying to south, but I just had, didn't have, did not have enough nerve to break off the formation. So I thought that uh, I might have a better opportunity later. Because at that time, we took off from air base near the Yellow River, went all the way down to the uh, North Korean capital, and then we went back without the wing tank. So I also wondered uh, my uh, fuel, how much fuel I might have left. So I was waiting until the uh, assignment near the uh, demilitarized zone, south of the Yellow River. OK, the final preparation was this. I decided I'll go. Before that, I was confused that uh, I want to go, but uh, after I defect, I just wonder what should I do for the living. But then I just forget about that. I just want to get out of there first. So my mind was all set. OK, right moment, I know there's a US air base uh, at the Kimpo, known as a K-14, the code number. And slightly south of there, is an air base by name of Suwon Air Base, is K-13. And south of there, another one, K-55. So I knew that uh, that's the place to go. And from North Korean capital, I know exactly how to get there. Now, luckily, about the end of August, we were relocated to the newly repaired air base just outside of North Korean capital, Pyongyang. That's where we went there, and uh, they brought the smaller planes lined up at the runway. And then uh, we haven't flown for about a month. They told us that uh, we have to fly because we cannot just sit around not flying over a month. They said, okay, everybody will fly tomorrow. I'm the one to fly, take off in the morning. That's it, I decided that I'm going. So on the September 21st, Sunday morning, even before the breakfast, I got in the plane and took off to the north. And then the plane went to north, and I came down south and toward the Pyongyang, toward the east. That that's where I finally made the defect. It was not easy because I thought, gee, what am I going to do? <laughs> this is almost. In fact, that defection was harder than uh, equivalent to say a uh, 50 combat mission. The one defection, that thing. But I finally decided, okay, I'm going. Turn the airplane, then degree that uh, compass you, degree. Sorry, just, so you're almost in mid-air, and you're still thinking, yeah. am I going to do it or not going to do it? Yeah, I had that. Yeah, I had that feeling. thing to do. I know that the, when I was flying toward the east, toward the Pyongyang, the capital, that my mind, my mind was that, uh, OK, I'm going. Then on the other hand, uh, gee, what am I? Isn't that too risky? War is already over. 
can I, can I just live here and get uh, promoted and someday to become a general? And then I thought that, gee, I cannot live here. I'd rather be uh, someplace and a uh, non-general would be better outside of this system. So I turned the plane uh, to the compass degree of uh, 170 degrees. That's not due south, slightly south and the east. That's exactly where the course is to the U.S. Air Base. Then I just gave a full throttle power and just went there. Okay, now that's it. If something happens, that's it. Uh, I'm ready to die. And then just went there. But then it's risky. When I cross over the demilitarized zone, then uh, this control tower started calling me that the where I was. So I, I wasn't uh, ready to respond because I was so busy. Soon after that, I saw the runway, and that's the runway I want to land. And then next thing was I worried was the F-86. If they might uh, look at, come around and maybe shoot at me, so I had to avoid them. But I saw already three or four or five F-86 around at that air base. They didn't see me, I saw them. And some couple of guys landing from the other side. That means north wind. So I'm coming down from north, and I cannot go around. I, my purpose was come down and touch down as quickly as possible. And the next worry was uh, anti-aircraft guns. If they shoot at me, then I have no chance to survive because I'm coming down slowly. And that was a worry to me. But then uh, I just took out the air brake, flaps down, landing gear, and rocked the plane and just came down. And then the next danger was uh, F-86 was coming down from the other end. And we were landing almost the same time he was coming down. And then I thought, that, gee, in order to avoid the head-on head -on collision, I was thinking of landing in the next runway, third strip. But because he's coming down against the wind, he was already touched down. Okay, now I can land. So I coming down. And then the next plane, his wingman was coming down. He was higher than me. I assumed that he saw me, but he hasn't seen me. And we just landed together. We passed together on the runway. And then after landed, and then... Uh, I knew what I should do. I look at the other side of the runway. I saw the F-86 were lined up. Well, that's a nice place to go. And uh, I just taxied the, then on the street up to me what I want to do. Taxi then next to the F-86, uh, and then uh, just stop there. And then after I stopped there, I opened the canopy. <coughs> of course, I don't have any, I didn't have any crewman there. I cannot ask anybody to bring the ladder. I just jumped out. <coughs> and then, uh, F-86 pilot jumped out. So we got together and we just shook hands. And then within a few minutes, about 50 of them came out uh, we shook hands. Then what we did was, I did was, uh, I didn't want to just stand around there and uh, do nothing. And I knew one word of English, which I learned at middle school. And then they advised English at the middle school. For six years, I haven't studied English. One English word I knew was motor car. I thought if I shout the motor car, somebody might bring the car or something and take me away from that site. I shouted motor car about 10 times. And then one pilot brought the Jeep and stopped right next to me. He said, oh, here's a motor car. So I jumped in the back of the uh, Jeep seat. And then he drove me to the headquarters. And then we went to headquarters and uh, I met the commander of the Air Force, General Anderson. And then next thing was that they took me to the uh, physical exam room. And then some reason I knew what he was talking about. The physician was uh, uh, checking my uh, physical condition. He said that uh, uh, all the pilots has to be, uh, have a physical exam after flight. So you flew the plane just now, so we have to give you a physical exam. For some reason I understood that. And then uh, he opened up the uh, a new instrument that this isn't the brand new one, you are the first one using this. That also I understood. So after that, we went back to the headquarters, commander's office, then went to the intelligence officer's uh, 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 office, and then interrogation started. And then uh, what I was thinking was that uh, my purpose was, uh, my, my goal was how to go to the United States. You see, that was my, but since I landed on the U.S. Air Base, I knew that uh, I'm in a good chance to go to the United States. 
But then I wondered, uh, how could I ever ask to go to the United States? Next, uh, my problem was, I cannot just ask somebody, grab that I want to go to the United States. That doesn't make any sense. But then that American intelligence officer by name of uh, uh, Don Nichols. Don Nichols is a very famous American uh, uh, spy uh, master in South Korea. I heard of his name in North Korea also. North Korea knows him. He sent many spies to North Korea, and uh, they mostly were captured. I was in his office uh, the first day I landed. That evening, he spoke Korean also. He told me that uh, when I was with him, he said that uh, yeah, when you go out to press conference tomorrow, tell them that you want to go to the United States. That's good for you. I'm just telling you, for your own uh, good future, tell them you want to go to the United States. Then I knew that, uh, see, that's the best advice I ever heard. So next day I went to press conference. They asked him, what do you want to do? I told him I want to go to the United States. So they knew that, uh, you see, Americans cannot say you cannot go that uh, I brought something, I brought the intelligence secrets that I want to go to the United States, they cannot, they say that, okay, you can go. I had absolutely no fear, and I came to this country, and I had a family, no family in North Korea. In fact, the North Korea uh, enacted that law in 1951 that any defector, the family of any defector will be executed. But I have nobody, my mother was already in South Korea. So uh, I had no fear. I just came over here. I was in the TV shows, went out to speeches. Because that was actually too much for me, but uh, no fear whatsoever. On 21 September 1953, the lid came off one of the most controversial subjects of recent years. It was the MiG-15, the red fighter interceptor surrounded by an aura of fact and fiction. Now we know about the MiG, what it can do and what it can't do. This is the story. The MiG landed at Kimpo Air Base at Seoul, Korea on Monday, September 21st. Its North Korean pilot collected $100,000 posted by the military for any pilot who could successfully deliver a MiG into our hands. At first, the plane was dismantled for shipment to the United States. But plans changed, and the MiG was taken to Okinawa instead. To prevent violating terms of the armistice, American officials offered to deliver it back to its rightful owners, but no takers came forward. The following Monday, at Kadena Air Force Base on Okinawa, the MiG was tugged out of the hangar ready to fly. Early in the morning, a plane load of Air Force specialists had arrived from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to conduct flight tests on the MiG. Major General Albert Boyd, commander of the Wright Air Development Center, was one of the trio of pilots who would fly the MiG. Captain H.E. Tom Collins, also of WADC, and Major C.E. Chuck Yeager of the Flight Test Center completed the trio. Air intelligence people already knew what to put in the plane standard JP-1 fuel. Oil was standard Air Force 1010, but the hydraulic fluid was a mixture of glycerin, castor oil, and water. In the cockpit, Russian language instrument labels were translated to English, and the pilots familiarized themselves with instrument placement. More than a score of technicians from Air Technical Intelligence Center and WADC checked over the craft prior to its initial flight. The aircraft's communist markings were changed, and every inch of the plane was inspected to make sure the MiG was structurally sound, and to ensure that the plane had not been booby-trapped. From the rear, the MiG's negative wing dihedral can be seen easily. Notice the large size of the rudder. Wing fences act as flow dividers to improve low-speed handling characteristics. Since the MiG's rightful owners might demand the plane back at any time, flight testing was begun immediately. The Jet Assist starting unit was standard Air Force equipment, the only modification being a specially made adapter plug. Metric system calibrated instruments were replaced by standard Air Force counterparts. An accelerometer was added since the MiG had no provision for one. 
An external free air temperature gauge was also added for test purposes. Later, a gun camera was rigged to take pictures through the gun sight during firing passes. Preliminary engine run and taxi tests were begun on the evening of the 28th in spite of rainy weather. During these, the braking system was checked. The MIG has no steerable nose wheel, but instead depends on differential braking of the main wheels to turn. Brakes are pneumatically operated from a compressed air bottle. No compressor is carried. Hence, the supply of braking air is extremely limited. The compressed air is also designed as an emergency system to operate the flaps and landing gear. Captain Collins climbed into the plane the following afternoon to become the first American to fly a MiG-15. On a later flight, two F-86 chase planes started down the runway at the same time. Notice how the MiG easily outdistances them due to the MiG's low thrust loading. This factor explains the unusually good climb characteristics of the MiG. On the first flight, Tests were made to determine low altitude level flight handling characteristics at medium speeds. Functional tests were made of all systems, landing gear, controls, speed brakes and engines, as well as handling characteristics in the landing pattern. Both in the air and on the ground, the MiG has an unusually clean appearance. Up close it can be seen that while workmanship is good in vital skin areas, less important areas have been somewhat neglected. A coating of transparent lacquer covers the plane to reduce drag, but at the same time, MiG designers have ironically added an external antenna. The craft proved basically sound, and all systems operated properly. It handled conventionally at medium and low speeds. Approach speed on the base leg was 150 knots, final approach 120 knots, and speed at touchdown 105 knots. Landing characteristics were similar to those of the F-80. To minimize brake wear, no attempt was made to shorten landing. Much of the plane's equipment was copied from obsolescent American equipment, such as the ARN-7 radio compass receiver. The copies, however, showed good workmanship. A unique feature of the MiG-15 is its armament system. Two 23mm cannons and one 37mm cannon are positioned beneath the air intake. Both guns and ammunition are contained in a package which can be lowered by one man. This feature greatly shortens the MiG's turnaround time, since a pre-loaded package can be slung under a returned MiG and accurately positioned almost immediately. Fortunately, the plane was delivered to the Air Force combat loaded, so armament tests could be made. When the cannons are firing, both shell casings and ammunition lengths are jettisoned. Ammunition can be fired steadily for only six seconds, as opposed to 14 seconds with the F-86. During flight tests, several air-to-water strafing runs were made to check gun sight accuracy, as well as static firing tests into a fixed target. It is interesting to note that throughout the performance tests, data obtained compared with uncanny accuracy with information previously acquired on the MiG by Air Technical Intelligence Center. The flights made by General Boyd and Major Yeager added to the knowledge that was piling up. A series of high altitude dives at high Mach numbers showed the MiG became difficult to control as speed increased, and at Mach 0.94, 
the aircraft became uncontrollable, falling out only on reaching denser air. The top speed of the MiG was slightly less than the F-86 at all altitudes, although the MiG's rate of climb exceeds the F-86 at all altitudes. The MiG climbs to 45,000 feet in nine minutes, while the F-86 takes 13 minutes. During dives, the F-86 is completely controllable at speeds which render the MiG control systems useless. During an altitude test, the MiG was climbed to 55,000 feet, while the F-86 could reach only 51,000 feet. In general, MiG handling characteristics at all speeds are not so good as the F-86 because of the MiG's small aileron surface and lack of elevator effectiveness. The MiG is most effective as a combat fighter at lower speeds, where its lower thrust loading allows greater maneuverability. Pilot protection on the MiG consists of an armor-plated ejection seat back of adequate thickness and the usual bulletproof glass. Fuel tanks, located in the fuselage, were not self-sealing. Oxygen and cabin temperature systems require constant pilot attention, as did most of the equipment in the plane. Pilots reported cabin temperatures as high as 42 degrees centigrade at low altitudes and below freezing temperatures at high altitudes. These extremes in working environments would seriously limit a MiG pilot's performance. At the conclusion of the tests, the tally sheet read like this. Desirable features of the MiG. One, ability of the MiG to operate over 50,000 feet. Two, 